Hello everybody, we have Matthew Stern again. He's going to talk about magazine writing back in the day and also Studio 64. Go! Yes. Okay, great. Um, now, Mark was talking a little bit about computer, what keying in computer programs for magazines. This is an example, this is one, and this is an educational program. All of this, going on to the next page, was code, and you had to go and type it all in. And of course, there were a lot of peaks and pokes, uh, especially if you're writing C64 programs. So, yeah, and again, if you made a mistake, if you had a typo in the middle of a program, you wouldn't know until after you tried to run it. So. I think a lot of people probably started out with programming that way. Now, I took a different approach to get into the computer industry. I wasn't a computer science major, although I did take a programming class in college. Hmm. By the way, am I uh, coming out uh, clearly? Yes. Okay. Uh, I did take a two programming class, and just to show you, how old I am, it was with a PL1 programming on punch cards on an IBM mainframe. Yes. That's <laughs> how far back it went. So, but I got into computing from writing. I was an English major, and I was, like all other English majors, trying to find a way that I could monetize this college degree that I was spending a lot of money to earn. And so I got a public relations job with a small Commodore software uh, company called Entech. They were, actually weren't too far away, they were in Studio City. Mm. And they started me out doing public relations, mm. writing press releases, but then I wound up writing everything that had to be done with, computer, with computers, including user manuals. And I also, <coughs> excuse me, I also found myself doing tech support for them at one point. And, and our solution for most technical problems was Turn off the tell them to turn off the computer <laughs> and restart it. <laughs> and that actually fixed 95% of the problems. <laughs> and what's strange today is that most problems with computers are fixed that way, aren't they? Like if your Wi-Fi isn't working, you turn off a router and turn it back on. Uh, even like with or they'll come up with fancy names like if your iPhone is acting up, they'll say, well, you need to reset your SMC. Okay, how do I do that? Well, you turn off the device and turn it back on. And even with, you know, I have a new electric vehicle, and you think it's the most advanced thing out there with years of technological development, and if something doesn't go right, they tell you, well, unplug the battery and plug it back in. So, it's sort of like how much have things, a lot, a lot of things haven't changed over the years. So, one of the programs that we worked on at NTech was called Studio 64, which was a music composition program. And we were taught, I think somebody mentioned yesterday about <clears throat> how popular Sid music is with young people today. Well, it was really popular with a lot of people back then as well. And because the Commodore 64 enabled us to do things with music that weren't possible. They weren't just simple bleeps and clicks. But we actually had, with the SID chip, we were able to do very sophisticated music. It had three separate voices, and you can address the, the ADSR envelope, attack, decay, sustain, and release, 
to produce a lot of different sounds. And so the person that I worked for was a musician, and he wanted to create a program that you can write music on your Commodore 64 and play it back. So, go ahead and start this up. Unplug the power and then... <laughs> Plug and <my> power <laughs> back in. Okay. So, I have a C64 Mini. And I think somebody has a C64 Maxi out there, which... Okay, so let's... And what's nice about it is you can go ahead and... With the... Uh, with their... Uh, Firmware update, you can put any programs you want on a USB stick and plug it in and play it, play them on your uh, C64 Mini or your Maxi. And this is a Studio 64. I'm going to sit down. So, here we go. And the way that Studio 64 works is here you can select your voice, you can select your clef, and then what you did, what it does is it takes the middle and the top row of your keyboard and turns it into the white and black keys of the piano. So, and then by repeating the uh, note, it increases the duration. Now this is an older version of the program and they were using text, the uh, text characters for the notes, which doesn't look very good, but, but it does make it very easy to add your... And then you can play your notes back. So, let's see, this one I'll do the virtual keyboard. And then you press the British pound key. Hmm. <laughs> so, Not so it makes it very easy to add notes, and then you can actually copy, select a section of your of your music and copy it and paste it. So you could even do some little editing. And rests are done the same way. They, for that, you use the space bar, I believe. Oops, Not that was good. What was rest? This is a program. It does have a help key, but in this case, you actually have to use, refer to the manual a lot. Matthew, when I was looking for this program online, I don't even think the manual's on, uh, uh, online. Uh, no, the manual, this is about, this is probably the only copy of the manual Ooh. that I, and I've been meaning to sit down <laughs> and to digitize this and post this somewhere. Ah, uh, very rare. Also, yeah, there are a lot of different music programs available online, but, C, but Studio 64 is one of those that wasn't, and... I did finally get my hands on the D64 uh, file for this. And I just have to figure out a good place to post that so you can share it. But same thing with the user guide is that you need to, I need to um, scan this and uh, post it somewhere. But uh, notes, let's see, where's, where's the rest? and then rest. It says that you can press the space bar to add a rest. Let's see. There you go. Rests are added the same way where you press the space. Yeah. And same thing, you keep pressing um, rest. You keep pressing the um, Character, you keep pressing those the uh, space bar and it increases the duration of the rest. Now, 
one thing is that there is an actual, there is a newer version of the Studio 64. They actually went through and redid it where they had actual bitmap notes and rests that look like notes and rest. And they added some new features, they added new songs, and I can't for the life of me find the disc for that. I know it exists, the disc exists somewhere for the for Studio 64 2.0, but I have not been able to find the disc. And I hope someday that you know I'll do a little more digging and see if maybe I might have it. But and then that would be a good thing to put on uh, to see if we can convert that and make that available as well. And and 2.0 is not online. Not as far as I know. I mm. even this is very hard to find online. So. Now another thing about Studio 64 is that it comes with some uh, demo songs to it. Okay, let's see. And then let's see, return is supposed to get you back to... Let's see. Okay, let's see. There you go. Yeah, it's one of these challenges where I'm trying to map the... Uh, this is the first time I'm using an actual keyboard. The C64 has a little keyboard, but it's just for decoration. If you get the Maxi, if you can find it, it does have the, an actual working keyboard. So as you can see here, you get it, they show you how the notes on your keyboard are mapped to the notes on a piano keyboard. Now, Studio 64 comes with some sample songs. I will pick the one that will cause us not to get a copyright strike. <laughs> <laughs> there are some other songs, there are about, I think, five songs on the original one. Whether they've been licensed or not, I don't know. And then you can select whether you want, want to get it from tape or disc. I don't think we ever did the tape version. I've only seen it as disc. Okay, it's waiting for it to. There we go. And then you can go ahead and play it. <laughs> How fast? The tempo? Yeah. In this case, it plays it really fast, but you can adjust the tempo. Well, it's played. Oh, it just stopped playing. Yes. But uh, do you know what the original price was on Studio 64 when it was first released? Oh, let's see. I would have to get the... Uh, was it the good old price of $29.95? Maybe. Let me see if I have it in my price list. Oh, a price list. This was a press kit that we distributed with mm. our product. Mm. And let's see, the quality remains. These are description. And we included all of our 
marketing material. Ah, here we go. Studio 64 was $39.95. Mm. Mm. Okay. And you could run through the inflation calculator <laughs> to see Ooh. how much that costs yeah. today. A lot of money. But yeah, this has all sorts of neat stuff like uh, one of the things we made available was the box that um, very 80s with the grid going off and lots of what pretty artwork. And then we had labels that you would stick on the back with the product description and the product name. Huh. Although I think for the Studio 64 program we did, or the second version of it, we did a clamshell. Uh, packaging, but um, I don't know what happened with that. And then there was also the process of getting disc envelopes and disc labels. There was a lot that went on with marketing software back then. We didn't have downloads, so that was how we distributed. But Studio 64 was our most popular program, and you can see why, because for starters, it's a good, it's a really nice program to demonstrate. And in fact, I think what we wound up doing was producing a demo disc, which had all the songs loop, that looped, and at the point, and I think we actually had spoken audio. This wow. was back when digitized voice first started. So being a, there was like a small little clip of recorded voice mm. that was uh, so it was really neat what we were able to do. And you could just go to trade shows and run that demo all day long. So that was... Uh, do you know what happened to that uh, demo or that disc of <laughs> That's another thing that must have vanished into, because I think somebody else mentioned this, but uh, what I think it's a mistake that a lot of us made when we finally unbundled our Commodore collections was we got rid of all of our programs, but we kept our data flat disks, and that was a mistake because you have to have the two to go together. I've only been able to find, and like for example, I have a lot of my, uh, one of the things that I found recently was a draft of a novel that I wrote for a creative writing class in college. It's the first 30 pages of a novel. And fortunately I have a hard copy. It was printed on, a, on an Epson RX80 dot matrix printer. So it's scannable, and I do have the data disk for it. I even found Paperclip, <laughs> uh, which was the program mm -hmm. I used to write it. But, it's, but then it's the challenge of getting it to convert it into a modern format. So, I'm sorry? It's Paperclip dongle, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I do. I have a Paperclip dongle. <laughs> so, uh, there you go. But it's one of those things where... Sometimes when you find, I did find a D64 file where you could actually run paperclip, but it's then one of those programs that really needs a manual as well. So, the, yeah. the text can be converted. There are converters even on the Commodore side to convert paperclip files. Yeah. Hmm. So that's really neat. At some point I'd love to convert that and make that available. So it was amazing how much we were able to do with the Commodore 64 back then. When I was showing was my manual. So we produced this entire manual on, on paperclip with a dot matrix printer. And, and actually, the in the old days, what we had to do is we got these printed, so we actually had to print out the pages, put them on paste-up boards, and then we would take them to a printer and they would photo, photograph them and make plates. Now what we did for the second version of, uh, of Studio 64 
was we went a little bit further. We actually took screenshots. The programmer found a way to create screenshots uh, from Commodore 64, from the Commodore 64. And you know, I wrote the documentation in paperclip, but I had to allow spaces to put these screenshots in. And we actually had to physically print out the screenshots, print out the, in this case, we decided to go up and get a daisy wheel printer to make it look nice, nicer. And we had to physically paste in the screenshots. But that, that manual was somewhere at, somewhere in my closet someplace. <laughs> I gotta find it. Thirty of the thirty-nine dollars went into like that manual. <laughs> that may be why the expense we put into the manuals. Why one of the reasons why Entech it yeah. might not be. But it was just a, it was a really exciting time, and it was and it began the foundation of what of, there are things that I learned from that experience that I'm still using today years later when we're talking about, you know, the basics of documentation design and create and how to connect with users. And yes. Wasn't there one rare game that Intech developed that people keep asking about, but it's never been found? Wait, yes there is. Polybius. What? Polybius. It's Polybius. Polybius? Yeah. <laughs> It was rumored that they made the game and it was causing people to freak out and like had seizures and stuff. <laughs> oh, it was a uh, test from the government and all this, these conspiracies were layered on top of this hmm. fictitious video game. Yes. Well, I never heard of Polybius, but there is one that was rumored that was never done called Babies of the Dirt. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, Ray Solar, who was the principal who started this company and was the programmer and pretty much did everything with it, he wrote a song, Babies of the Dirt, and it was a, it was a game idea, it never got developed, oh. it was promoted. <laughs> I don't know if he if it's listed on this. Oh. So you don't know if there are any copies that still exist? Babies of the Dirt, I don't think, was ever finished because uh, okay. I never saw it. And it did appear on some lit on some lists uh, or and some advertisements, but it never got produced. But he did include the song on that demo disc for the second version of Studio 64. Oh. So again, if I can find that disc. <laughs> There might be the only living connection to what was going to be the game Babies of, Babies of the Dirt. Thank you. Yes. So from my experience at, at, at Antech, I went into uh, user documentation, but also I made connections that got that enabled me to get into magazine writing. And in June of 1986, I had the opportunity to write the cover story for Run that announced Geos. And Geos was a revolutionary program. Uh, when I was, when it came out, I had gone to from Entech to working from a, for a company called Haba that made software for the Apple Macintosh. Hmm. And I'm talking Macintosh, not Mac. This was, I had, a, my work system was a 512K uh, Macintosh. And this was the company that wanted to be the first at any new platform that came out. So they had, pro when I was interviewing, they had prototypes of this computer from Atari that they wouldn't see wouldn't let anybody see. Atari had lots of non-disclosure agreements. And that's the computer that you just bought, <laughs> the Atari 520ST. So we bought, wrote a bunch of products, programs for Atari as well. But uh, so by the time Geos came out, I was really familiar 
with the Mac, and everybody talked about, well, the Mac has this great uh, performance, it has the latest technology, there's no way any of these older 8-bit computers can do what the Mac does. Well, Geos did it. It was able to do this really sophisticated user uh, GUI mouse driven interface on a Commodore 64. Now, I've been trying to find a good version of Geos to run on this thing, and I found one, but I picked the wrong one that won't even run on this device. So I wish I could have Geos here to show you. Although I think we pro I'm sure somebody around here has a C64 with Geos. But it was truly an amazing product because you could do everything that you could do with a Mac. You had all these different applications. They were graphic intensive. They had Geos Write and Geos Paint. And Geo they came out with a bunch of add-on programs called the like Geofile. And that worked great with the uh, Commodore. Commodore did a version of the mouse that worked just like the one, it was just like the tank mouse on the Amiga. And you, it, was, uh, it was just a wonderful pro program to use. So I wrote a column for them for run for a number of years. Uh, my schedule got busy and uh, I wasn't able to continue. But again, it was just, I think in many respects, Geos helped to extend Commodore 8-bit for a number of years because it, it really showcased the capabilities. They did have a Geos 128, which I think I played with. So I was in the Commodore world, and, and I talked about this yesterday until um, 1991. And what happened was, was I got a job at AST. Uh, that was my first, that was, a, and I moved to Orange County. And AST had moved from becoming a add-in board maker to a full-blown PC maker. And I knew the writing was on the wall, that PCs were starting to match what Commodore computers were doing in terms of graphics and audio with things like Sound Blaster and, you know, with Windows was starting to, they had Windows 3.1, which was starting to become a more modern interface and then that moved into Windows 95, which definitely moved the platform over. And plus with all the things that were going on at Commodore, it, it, that that future was, it wasn't uh, tenable. And I know that we talked a little bit about all the mistakes that Commodore made over the years, but the reality was the computer industry was brutal in the 1990s, as, as all of you probably remember. And even AST, which was at one point a leading developer of PCs, it was up there with Compaq and HP, or well, Compaq and IBM. Uh, eventually, Commodore or AST succumbed as well because what was happening was that computers were becoming standardized. There was no real differentiation. People were beating other manufacturers for price. And then when the internet came out, then that completely changed the industry. So it would have been. Apple had a hard time making it in the 90s. It wasn't until really the iPod where they even sort of started moving away from traditional computers that they were finally able to make, become the juggernaut that they are today. So it would have been unlikely for Commodore to have survived even if they made the right choices in that really competitive marketplace. And we have the Geos right over here. There we go. There you go. Yeah. So if you want to go and play with uh, Geos, you can take a look at it. And it really is a remarkable product because it's responsive. It does a lot of different. It does a lot of things. 
that we were able to do with Max and even other um, GUI-driven interfaces at the time. So it's a really impressive uh, feat. So when so this was sort of the history that I wanted to capture in my novel Amiga is about what it was like to be a part of this exciting time in the computer industry where we were just learning what these products can do and how far they can go. And to remember when computers were exciting and fun things. And there's this one line that I'll wrap things up with from my book, which sort of explains the when we're trying to talk about the, what the Amiga meant to us, to younger people. And I said, this is a scene where my main character, Laura, is showing an Amiga to her adult children in 2016 for the first time. I turned on the monitor and the CPU, the fan world word. The screen showed a picture of a hand holding the Amiga Kickstart floppy disk. I was relieved to see the computer got that far. But Henry muttered, is it broken? I gazed back at him. He shrugged. Then why doesn't it boot? I have to insert a disk. I fished through the ancient blue floppy disks until I found the one with Amiga Kickstart. <laughs> the floppy disk drive whirred and grunted. Henry and Stacy, who had never seen a computer that didn't boot instantly from a hard drive, looked at it in puzzlement, especially when the hand with the floppy disk prompted for the Amiga workbench disk. I ejected the kickstart disk and inserted the workbench one. Henry turned to Kevin, who's my main character's husband. Did your first computer work this way? Mine used cassette tape. Stacy looked at him. What's cassette tape? <laughs> the screen turned blue. The Amiga DOS window appeared and displayed the startup messages. And each grunt of the floppy drive made windows and icons appear. The Amiga workbench emerged in its blue, white, and orange glory as if all those years hadn't passed by. Henry gasped in amazement. Wow, that is so 8-bit. <laughs> I turned to him and smiled. Actually, it's 16-bit with a 32-bit processor. Uh. Stacy leaned forward. What does it do? I turned back to the Amiga. Wonderful things. So that is the history that is, this is why what you're doing here today is so important. It's not only to revive the memories that was meant that we were, we were talked about yet yesterday, the joy that we experienced when we first opened these computers 40 years or, or so ago, but also we need to educate the younger generation about how the technology that they depend upon every day came from these computers. So this is why what you're doing here for refurbishing and sharing and innovating and moving the technology forward is so important. And that's why I'm proud to be a part of this community. Thank you very much. Questions for Matthew? I skimmed through your book, Matthew, and yeah. you, you separated it into uh, chapters on 1985, 1986, yeah. and then 2015, 2016. And I found the chapters on 1985, 1986 much more interesting because, <laughs> because they were talking about Amiga computers, they were talking about even the Commodore 64. I said, all right, yes. this is the stuff I'm interested in. Yeah. But it's also fun to look, you know, about, you know, the, the 2016 talk about a lot of family things, about the stuff that, 
the character goes through, but it also talks about like the you know learning about this old technology and what does that technology mean to us today. So, and if you're interested in the book, I still have uh, copies for sale. They're uh, eighteen dollars and with tax included. The, uh, I also have my other books. The Remainders is another novel for $18. And Mastering Table Topics, if you're interested in public speaking, that's $10. And you can get all three books for $10 off for $36. Okay, thank you again, Matthew. Thank you. The Commodore, Los Angeles, Super Show.